heard in the first opening plenary of this conference. My pleasure in that this honor is vastly increased by the privilege of introducing my friend of longstanding, Paul Cartledge. In the brief time appropriate for these remarks, I can barely touch on the remarkable intellectual accomplishments of Paul's illustrious academic career. He has contributed so significantly to our understanding of Greek antiquity. Naturally, I must mention his work on Sparta, starting with his first book, Sparta and Laconia, a regional history, 1300 to 362 BC. That was a book of 1979. That was followed by Agesilaus and the Crisis of Sparta in 1987. And in 1991, with Anthony Sparforth, Hellenistic and Roman Sparta. A rich flow of focused studies, numbering several dozen, in my count, have followed Paul, have followed. Paul's contributions have served as an inspiration to so many of us who work on Sparta, and he has trailblazed paths for the many young academics to keep alive our fascination with this singular polis. Nonetheless, he has always mixed in studies in other topics of interest to him and to us also. Early on, there were inquiries as disparate as those on the Emperor Augustus, the historiography of Gibbon, and the Dutch economic historian of antiquity, Ioannis Hazebrook. Paul has edited or co-edited on my count 11 volumes, with my excuses for missing any, I'm sure I have. He's <laughs> also treated us over even more recently, ever more recently, uh, to many book projects that range from the foundations of his learning to more general audiences, such as works on Alexander the Great and Thermopylae. Paul has spent the majority of his academic career at Cambridge, where he retired as the A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture and a Fellow of Clare College. From there, he has supervised many students at all levels and generously mentored many scholars. In fact, I've been in rooms where an appreciable portion of the people in, uh, in place were in fact those who had been helped at one point or another by their career, at uh, one point or another of their career, by Paul Cartledge. So I give you Professor Cartledge. Dear Tom, hello everybody from Cambridge in England. Sunny now uh, for a change. Uh, it normally isn't, but it's uh, unseasonably cold. Let me begin with some thanks, of course, to your brilliant organizer, Carmen Suarez. What a program has been lined up for you over the days to come. Quite extraordinary. Very, very impressive. And then secondly, to Daniela Pereira, who has been indisputably indispensable on the technical side, enabling me to speak to you via this StreamYard program. After those two locals, I have to thank dear Tom, Tom Figuera, for agreeing to chair this very important, I hope, and I hope very interesting session. Tom and I, as he says, go back many, many years, and uh, he has been more than generous to me, as well as in what he has just said uh, about me. And not the least of his services, this came as a complete surprise to me, was when I discovered that he'd actually dedicated a collection of papers on Spartan society to me. And I was particularly honoured and pleased because it was within a series founded by our sadly late colleague, uh, Anton Powell, who died not very long ago. And so whenever I speak about Sparta or ancient Greece, Anton's memory is now not very far away. And his, sadly, his widow, Joanna Kralli. And then thirdly, I must, of course, thank all of you my audience, and I was originally going to say, invisible there you are, but actually <laughs> some of you are visible 
really in a, a lecture theater. And today that's something quite extraordinary. About two weeks ago, I did attend a, a real lecture in a Cambridge college. It was Selwyn College. The lecture was about China, contemporary. And uh, this was the first time I'd been in a college, in a college lecture theater for about 15 months. So I'm just hoping and praying that with the vaccinations being rolled out, uh, ultimately globally, that sort of lecture experience will once again become normal. Now, Portugal and the United Kingdom or Great Britain allegedly have the oldest alliance. That is, I think, certainly from our side, you Portuguese are our oldest allies, except that I'm speaking to you in the middle of Euro 2020. And it's not impossible that any feelings of warm friendship between England and Portugal might disappear in the next uh, 10 days or so if we happen to meet on the soccer field. So with that in mind, let me begin my, my little talk about what have the ancient Greeks, of course, ever done for us? I'm going to be speaking about the Hellenic legacy or aspects of what we have chosen to count as our legacy, our inheritance from the ancient Greeks in specifically contemporary, that is 21st century, 2021 context. I'm going to see whether, how far, in what ways we can, and uh, I believe we can, I shall argue that we can, learn from the ancient Hellenic past or an ancient Hellenic past. Subject to one major proviso, and this actually is a thought which informs a great deal of my own work, and it's a quotation from an English novelist called L.P. Hartley. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And it's this modulation between similarity or even identity and difference that I think gives one of the points of salience to any study by us today of anything pretty much ancient Greek. So why should we continue to study the ancient Greeks in a nutshell, because they were both like us in crucial ways. They are our cultural ancestors, but in other ways, often very fundamental other ways, they're not like us. They are very, very different from us. How to cut a thicket, uh, cut through the thicket of the Hellenic past and its legacy? Well, I've chosen as my guide an acronym, and there is a handout which uh, possibly was already pre-circulated, but if not, it can be circulated to you afterwards. And the name which I have chosen as the source of my acronyms is Parthenon, or rather what we for short refer to as the Parthenon, because as I'm sure you know, Parthenon was just one chamber of the original building. Actually, the Parthenon is a very odd ancient Greek temple in all sorts of ways, as well as being a very exceptional temple in all sorts of other ways. And the reason I chose it for my acronym apart from the fact that um, I'm particularly fond of it and I'm uh, deeply involved in a campaign to try to reunify the marbles, the original sculptures that uh, were made in and for the Parthenon but are now scattered and, for example, are in London's British Museum. I choose it because, as uh, our now very elderly colleague Peter Green once put it, almost half a century ago, the Parthenon still casts a shadow, a very long cultural shadow indeed. That metaphor can of course be taken in more than one way, negatively as well as positively. 
And that, for me, can stand as a metaphor for the entirety of the ancient Hellenic legacy or tradition, as I've tried already to indicate. Often it's not a case of black or white, but rather of infinite shades of grey in between. So I begin, it's a bit of a, a cheat here, with letter P in English, <laughs> because in ancient Greek philosophy began with a phi, P, H, an aspirated P. So my P of Parthenon stands for philosophy and philosophies. It could have been just Plato, not least because it seems that it was Plato who coined the original term philosophia. Or it could have been because, as a much more recent commentator put it, the whole tradition of Western philosophy is, in one sense, but a series of footnotes to the philosophy of Plato. But apart from the fact that uh, I'm rather averse myself to what I take to be Plato's own brand of political philosophy, his ideology, if you like, radically anti-democratic. I haven't chosen Plato deliberately because what I want to emphasize is that the ancient Greeks developed many more philosophies and indeed schools of philosophy than just Plato's and Plato's academic tradition. Most famous of them, and to begin with, after Plato, the most influential in antiquity, was the tradition that stemmed from the work of Plato's most brilliant former student. Um, Tom kindly spoke about my former students. Would I would give quite a lot to have had Aristotle as one of them. Aristotle, son of Nicomachus, came not from Athens, but from Stagara or Stagaros up in the north of mainland Greece. And he therefore lived and taught in Athens, not as a citizen, he never became one, but as a metoikos or metic, a resident alien. It's an interesting thought. I'll be coming back to Aristotle and his peripatetic philosophy right at the end of this uh, short talk, when I come to the second N of Parthenon. Contemporaneously with the last decades of Aristotle's quite short life, he died in 322 BC, BCE, aged only 62, there lived the founders of the two most influential ancient Greek philosophical schools of all, Epicureanism and Stoicism. Epicurus was an Athenian though he was a foreign-born one, from the Athenian colony on the far eastern Aegean island of Samos, that's just off the Turkish coast today. Famously, Epicurus and his disciples, back in Athens, inhabited and in a metaphorical sense cultivated a garden, a garden of rest, of repose and tranquility, a desirable state state of the soul, conceived predominantly in a negative sense. That is, so far from being pleasure-seeking sensualists, Epicureans sought above all freedom from, freedom from psychological disturbance, a mental state that they called ataraxia, not being taratoed, disturbed. One of the major sources of discontent, so Epicurus divined, was the divine, the superhuman, in the form of the gods and goddesses, who most conventional Greeks, including most Athenians, believed regularly intervened in mortal human affairs, and often not in a comfortable or comforting way. Epicurus's intellectual response was to banish all gods and goddesses, whose existence, whose actuality he didn't deny, he wasn't an atheist, to banish them theoretically, 
to a sphere outside that of everyday human existence, to a place where they simply could not and did not trouble humans. Many ordinary Athenians and other Greeks found that philosophy rather too abstract, austere, and above all, impractical. It appealed enormously to the uber-intellectual Roman didactic poet Lucretius, whose six-book epic on nature was a hymn to the nostrum that, and this is his phrase in um, book one, line 101, tantum religio potuit suadere malorum. So much of evils is religion capable of urging, that is mankind, to commit. But more ordinary ancient Greek mortals, and later their Roman successors too, found more of practical value in one or other version of the philosophy originally credited to one Zenon or Zeno. Now Zeno was a Hellenized, non-Greek immigrant to Athens from the Cypriot city of Kition or Kitium. And in these, dare I say, woke days, it's probably as well to emphasize the diversity and inclusivity of ancient Hellenic culture wherever we possibly can. Now that philosophy that he is credited with founding is known generically as Stoicism because Zeno taught not in a fancy gymnasium like Plato and Aristotle, not in a private garden like Epicurus, but in and around the Stoa Poikile, or painted colonnade or portico, which lay on the north side of Athens's civic centre, its agora, so that anyone who wished could come along, hang out and listen without having to be formally enrolled as a student or formally admitted as a member of a closed community. Today, and this is something that I'm not sure is entirely a good thing, though it's all too understandable, it is without doubt Stoicism or variants of Stoicism that attract by far the most adherents in Western countries. We have a lot to cope with and to put up with in pandemic-ridden uh, worlds of economic and political uncertainty. And so to bear it stoically is surely one advisable response. But if I say that stoicism started out by regarding the possession of material wealth as spiritually and morally immaterial, but then ended by embracing wealth as a necessary component of living a life of virtue, well, you can see, I think, how over time the founder's original rather pure, indeed Puritan ideals, became quite horribly corrupted. So much then for that first letter, P. I move on to A, A for alphabet. In ancient Greek, alpha means nothing, ditto, beta or beta. But in the original Semitic languages from which the Greeks borrowed and readapted the signs that they used to create their own fully phonetic alphabetic scripts, aleph meant ox head and bet meant house. And that is why the alphabetic signs, aleph, and bait looked like something like schematized versions of an ox head and a house, respectively. The Greeks were not always over generous in acknowledging alien, barbarian, non Greek wisdom. They normally preferred to fight it out amongst themselves for the treasured title of first discoverer, Protos Eurytes. But in the case of their alphabets, and there were many local versions of the Greek alphabet, they both credited a non-Greek inventor, Cadmos, from Tyre in what they called Phoenicia, 
And they gave to their Greek letters, the alphabet, the ethnic descriptor, Phoenician. When, where, and why a Greek or some Greek invented an alphabetic script is strictly unknowable. But by 700 BC, BCE, Hellenic alphabetic literacy was already quite widespread. And within a century of that, it had been put to use to write out, and so in some sense crucially help to preserve, the two works that together constitute both the very first extant works of ancient Greek uh, literature, but also the first masterpieces of Western literature. And I'm meaning, of course, to refer to the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, they were both ascribed uh, dubiously to a single author whom the ancient Greeks called Homeros, Homer. I have to add, though, that uh, this is just for the record. Alphabetic literacy was not always used for the highest of literary purposes, but uh, also for writing uh, sexual, personal insults. Uh, and so what's new, you might well ask. Well, those two Homeric poems, so far from being the products of the genius of a single uh, mind, were the end products of a centuries-long oral bardic tradition, a continuous process of the invention, the memorization, the reworking, and the reproduction of dactylic hexameter lines, going back in some cases at least as far as the 13th century BC, BCE. On the other hand, I do believe there is this grain of truth in the singular appellation Homer, namely that someone, some individual, not necessarily the same individual for both epics, must have had the genius to realise that out of the many hundreds and thousands of traditional formulaic lines could be produced a single narrative, a story a theme, a thesis. In other words, by organising them under one overarching theme, someone somehow contributed to creating what eventually became the Iliad and the Odyssey. In the case of the Iliad, that theme or thesis was the anger of Achilles. And in the case of the Odyssey, it was the wanderings of, and then here's the formula, much enduring godlike Odysseus. Consider just this. Although the Iliad's title, Ilias in Greek, means a poem about Elion, or Troy, as Elion was alternatively known, even after what the later scholars broke up into 24 books, more than 15,000 lines, even then, by the end of the Iliad, Troy still has not fallen. You want to know how Troy fell? Then you have to turn to the Odyssey and to Book 8, where the fall of Troy is described, not by Odysseus himself, as it happens, but by the court bard of a Phaeacian, again a non-Greek, king and his queen. This is in itself a form of genius, as indeed was the idea of creating a fully phonetic alphabetic script out of the non-vocalic Semitic scripts. My next letter is, uh, and uh, wait for this, this may come as a bit of a shock, R for Romans. Now, it's true that patriotic Greeks like to think that Rome, which they spelt in Greek letters Rome, was a Greek city whose name meant strength, because Rome was the Greek for strength. It's true, too, that some Romans like to think that some Greeks were literally their ancestors, their forebears, their genetic ancestors. 
actually, and here we moderns can separate off myth in the negative sense of an untrue story from fact, the true nature of the connection between Hellenes and Romans is not genetic, it's not a natural one, but it's a purely cultural one. Put very simply, the Romans, I mean some very influential Romans, took the Greeks, that is some very influential Greeks, for their cultural ancestors. Horace put it succinctly, Graecia capta ferum victorem capit et artes, intulit agresti latio. Captive or conquered Greece, which itself, by the way, is a diminishing term. The Greeks called Greece Hellas, not Graecia. Greece took its fierce conqueror captive and introduced arts or the arts into rustic Latium. Not all arts, of course. The Romans didn't think that all their military and other technologies were straight borrowing from the ancient Greeks. Not even all the literary arts, because they were very keen on insisting that satire was entirely a Roman creation. But what they were referring to chiefly were the literary arts, the literary genre from epic Homer right on down. From my point of view though, and that's the point of view of what is our Hellenic inheritance, how should we evaluate it? It wasn't so important that the Romans, or rather Italians, produced their own epic master in the form of Virgil, their own lyric master in the form of Horace, and so on. What matters is that cultivated intellectual Romans were, in literary terms, bilingual in Latin and Greek, and that they therefore thought it was worth not just imitating Greek originals, but preserving them, indeed copying them in the physical manual sense, copying them out and putting copies of the texts in libraries, both public and private. So that alongside and in imitation of the Greeks' own museum and library at Alexandria in Egypt, there arose, for example, the private library of what's almost certainly Julius Caesar's father-in-law at uh, Herculaneum. And for, uh, to give you an example of a public library, the public library of Romanized Pergamum in Northwest Anatolia. Now, had it not been for those libraries and those Romans, I wouldn't be speaking to you now. From R, I move to an area of culture in which the Romans were very, very slow to copy, let alone to imitate or try to surpass their Greek cultural forebears. And I'm referring here to T, the next letter in the Parthenon, T for theatre. A bit of a cheat because it's T-H. In ancient Greek, the neuter noun theatron meant both the physical space within which spectators spectated, Greek for spectators is theatai, literally viewers. They viewed the drama, literally the thing done on the stage or in the orchestra in front of the stage, the dancing ground, the orchestra. And theatron meant also the collectivity of the spectators themselves. There was, in other words, a perfect symbiosis of the two. The Athenians were by no means unique among ancient Greeks in being exceptionally keen on theatre. There were, for example, Sicilian Greeks in Syracuse who were equally keen. And there were others in what the Greeks called Great Hellas, Megali Hellas, South Italy who felt similarly, for example, in Taras, or Tarentum, modern Taranto. But it was the Athenians who arguably invented theatre in ancient Greece, and arguably too invented an idea of theatre that is still the ultimate ancestor of our own. 
Now, my two most recent books give a special place and weight, therefore, to ancient Athenian theatre. Those books are Democracy Alive and Thebes, the Forgotten City of Ancient Greece. Theatre features specially in my democracy book because it was one of the several ways, and not the least important way, in which the Athenians practiced their version or versions of democratia, people power, a form of self-government which they too invented and not coincidentally developed simultaneously with the development of theatre. Attending the theatre in classical Athens was for a citizen to take part in an act of communal, civic, religious worship of the god Dionysus, the Onisos. And so important was taking part, considered to be, that some 15,000 spectators, it's estimated, might take part at one time the poorest of them paid for by a special state dole. And then at the end of the three, sometimes it was five days proceedings, a randomly selected by lot, a democratic process, few audience members voted also democratically, one person, one vote. And they were, as it were, the committee. They handed out the Oscars for best producer, and best actor, all in a democratic way. As for the Thebes book, Athenian theatre gets a whole chapter in it because it's thanks to the Thebans and their immensely fertile local mythology that the very greatest of the Athenians' tragic poets, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, all were enabled inspired to write some of the greatest surviving ancient tragedies. I'm referring to the Seven Against Thebes, the Antigone, the Oedipus plays, the Bacchae. All were written by Athenians and mostly for Athenian audiences, but on Theban themes. So what was it about Thebes, ancient Greek Thebes, that so caught the imaginations of both the playwrights and the audiences. I think it's not uh, exactly uh, difficult to imagine. All those horrible personal and private or public and civic issues were much more easily projected or retrojected upon another people, the Thebans, uh, a people who for much of the fifth century were enemies of Athens, much more easy for those bad things to be attributed to the Thebans than to be attributed to the Athenians themselves. And what are these bad things? Well, child exposure, patricide, incest, civil war, filicide, you name it, you get the picture. Those still, and this is perhaps more of a puzzle, happen to be themes that catch, even today, the modern imagination. And I believe the Antigone is the most performed today, in, of course, um, vernacular versions of all the ancient Greek tragedies. I move on then next to H. H for, well, this is a no-brainer for me. Herodotus and history. I mentioned earlier I wouldn't be speaking to you now if it wasn't for the Romans. Well, I wouldn't be a historian of any sort, not just an ancient Greek one, if it wasn't for Herodotus of Halicarnassus and later Thurii and his what we call histories, his magnum opus. Our word history comes from the ancient Greek word that Herodotus chose to headline in his preface, Historiae. Though for him, that meant primarily research or inquiry, rather than the history that he composed on the basis of those uh, techniques of uh, inquiry. Herodotus was what today, I think, we would call a total historian. 
Put it this way, unlike his immediate successor, Thucydides of Athens, he wasn't specifically or uniquely a historian of politics, diplomacy, and warfare. He was also a historian of culture, society, religion, ethnicity, gender, you name it. His first four books, as they were later divided up by Alexandrian scholars out of nine, were primarily ethnic geographical. They answered the causal question, who were these Persians? And what was the nature of their empire? That from what we call the 540s on clashed with, and then eventually tried to conquer Greeks, both of the Asiatic uh, continent and also of mainland or old Greece. The remaining five books, five to nine, dealt more narrowly with the clashes of the 490s and the 480s, the battles culminating in those of Salamis, and I note that panel one of this great conference is devoted to Salamis and its uh, reception, and Plataea, that the relatively few and very disunited Greeks who resisted the Persian invasion somehow managed to win, thereby raising the eternal question, I'm sure it must have been at the back of Herodotus's mind too, very often it's at the forefront of our minds, what would have happened to Hellas, to the Greek world? to Greek civilization, and therefore to its legacy, our inheritance, had those few Greeks not won, defeated Xerxes' invasion. Would there have been, for example, a Thucydides to write up in a very different way the history of the clashes that followed, not between Greeks and Persians, but between Greeks and Greeks? between Spartans and Athenians. What we do know, leaving aside those what-ifs, is that Thucydides wrote, he invented a very different kind of history from that invented and practiced by Herodotus, and that between them they were, as it were, the twin founders, the founding fathers of history as an intellectual practice and discipline. So from just one, though it's a very capacious intellectual discipline history, I move on to a master, an individual master of many disciplines, a genuine polymath. And his name begins with Epsilon or short E, and he is the E in Parthenon, Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes flourished in the third century BCE, the Hellenistic period, as we call it. And he was a diaspora Hellene from Cyrene, Kurini, in what's today eastern Libya. But he did his great work, his great intellectual work, further east along the North African coast, specifically in the royal capital of the post-Alexander the Great Ptolemaic Kingdom. And indeed, he did great work in the field as well. Eratosthenes was given in antiquity, misleadingly, a nickname, Beta. Not because he was a Beta as opposed to an alpha male, but because though he was brilliant and a genius across many, if not all, the many uh, intellectual disciplines that were then recognized, he was not, as it were, numero uno in any one of them. Take mathematics, for example. Numero uno, Archimedes. Take literary criticism. Numero uno, Aristarchus. And yet, so good were Eratosthenes' mathematics and his astronomy that he managed to measure the circumference of the entire globe, our planet Earth, to within a very tolerable degree of error. And so acute was his literary criticism, his historically based literary criticism, that he uttered what I consider to be a devastating blow 
to those who believed, and there are still some who today still believe, that the Odyssey and the Iliad are somehow fact-based. And he did so by asking, I'll believe in the historicity of those poems. When you find and you bring me the cobbler who sewed up the leather bag in which the master wind god Aeolus enclosed all the winds of the universe. In short, Eratosthenes possessed and applied a genuinely scientific empirico critical attitude to data, following resolutely in the footsteps of Aristotle to whom, as I say, we shall be returning. But first, before we get to him, I'm going to make a turn, as it were, a left field move. I'm going to move entirely for a moment away from the pagan, polytheistic, pre-Christian, third century BCE world inhabited by Eratosthenes and his fellow worshippers of the Nine Muses at Alexandria to the first century CE, or rather AD, Anno Domini, world of Palestine. So my N stands for New Testament. Here, a few ex-Jews or reformed Jews made the world anew by creating using the common, the Koine Greek dialect of that era, a brand new, and the Greek for that is kine, with an alpha as opposed to an omicron, diatheke, a New Testament. This is, in other words, the Christian New Testament Bible, which they wrote, or at any rate disseminated, throughout the Eastern Roman Empire, making such an impact that the hate word Christian was coined in Antioch, Hellenistic, originally Antioch, in Syria. And people designated or rather smeared as Christians, those people were burned as such in Rome on the orders of Emperor Nero Caesar in AD 64. Amongst those burned, uh, according to pious tradition, were Peter and my namesake, Paul, originally Shaul. My point here is this, but for the common Hellenic tongue, the Koine dialect of Greek, this newfangled religious doctrine would not have had the technical capacity, even potentially, to influence anyone outside the confines of Palestine. Whereas what actually happened within a mere few centuries, the New Testament enshrining the new uh, doctrine had become the sacred text of Catholic Orthodox Christianity, all good Greek words, Catholic Orthodox Christianity, the official religion of the entire Roman Empire, an utterly different kind of monotheistic religion from that which any who were not ex-Jewish proto-Christians would have recognized in the last, in the first century, or could have dreamed would become dominant just a few centuries later. From N, I move uh, penultimately to O, Omicron, or in this case, Omega because my O is Okeanos, our ocean. And so I'm going back here to the very foundational theologico-mythical text of all the Hellenes, all the pagan pre-Christian Hellenes, which was in its own way as foundationally cultural, as culturally foundational as the Homeric poems. And of course, I'm referring to Hesiod's Theogony, which is a near contemporary of those two epics, literally the birth of the gods and the goddesses. The Greeks, by which I mean the pagan Greeks, being ancient Greeks, 
texts, had no sacred texts, no vocational priesthood, no dogmas of faith. That was all very unchristian of them. But the theogony of Hesiod was accorded something like the authoritative status as an account of the genealogies of the gods and goddesses of the her heroes and heroines from whom all true Hellenes believed they were descended or were able somehow to derive their own ancestry and pedigree, whether individually or collectively. Now, out of that myriad of gods, goddesses, heroes, heroines, I selected just the one, Okeanos, because he is literally boundless. Why? Because he is himself, or was considered to be himself, the all-encompassing bound or boundary of the entirety of what the ancient Greeks called their oikoumene, the inhabited, humanly inhabited world. Well, what interests me as a historian about Okeanos is not his, as it were, geophysical presence, or his mythological role, his aboriginally generative status in ancient Greek mythology. What interests me is his role as a target of all too human ambition. Yes, Alexander the Great, I'm thinking of you. The sources for Alexander are, historiographically speaking, pretty dreadful. They're biased, they're incomplete. They're mostly non-contemporary, and so on and so on. But one thing does leap out of the pages of the one that we think is probably the best of the extant ancient narrative accounts, that of Arian of Nicomedia in the second century CE. He was a former student of a Stoic teacher, Epictetus, Epictetus an ex-slave. He was also a politician and a military man who straddled the worlds of both Greece and Rome. One of the things that struck Arian most about Alexander, about his mentality, about what seemed to be making Alexander tick, as it were, was the quality of pothos, very fierce desire. Often pothos came with a geographical dimension. So Alexander had a pothos to visit a, a particular place or site, for example. Now that was certainly the case with his pothos to keep driving his armies ever tiring, ever further to the east. Why? Because his ultimate goal was to reach Okeanos, the engirdling sea surrounding the entirety of the Oikumene. Sadly for him, uh, he unfortunately was not unaware that there was a little bit of a gap between um, Pakistan, northern India, and the far eastern ocean. He knew nothing about China. And I think in a way we should um, either credit or blame his teacher for that geographical ignorance. And I'm referring here, of course, to Aristotle, who taught Alexander and some other comrades at Mieza in the uh, 350s, 340s uh, BC, BCE. And so we come to my final letter, N, Nicomachean Ethics, N for Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle left Plato's Academy in 347, aged uh, about 37, not to return to Athens for a dozen years. On his return, by which time Alexander was uh, king of all mainland Greece, shortly to set off for the east to conquer the Persian Empire, on his return, Aristotle founded a new institute for advanced study. We call it for short, the Lyceum. Because Aristotle was in the habit of teaching orally on the hoof, walking, uh, his philosophy came to be known as, and the school came to be known alternatively as the peripatos, hence peripatetic philosophy. But of course, Aristotle didn't just teach, let alone research and write on the hoof. He also wrote 
and research sitting down. And what he wrote covered, indeed, often systematized and defined all the then known branches of learning. Aristotle was himself primarily a natural scientist, a biologist, a botanist, a zoologist. But he also did, as we might say, politics and political philosophy and moral philosophy. And he believed that the two, political and moral philosophy, or moral philosophy and politics, were mutually implicated, which is why the Nicomachean ethics are, as it were, part one of a two-volume project, the second volume, the second part of which is what we call the politics. Now, I'm just going to pull two strands from this multi-stranded work of ethics and moral political philosophy. First, Aristotle's definition of what counts as being virtuous. And secondly, the very significant proportion of the treatise that he devotes to various definitions of friendship. If I take those in reverse order, a polis or citizen state was, according to Aristotle, a community or a commonality, a koinonia of friends, philoi. It had, therefore, it had to have a basic component of equality. But of course, that basic component went along with all sorts of inequalities, as we are all too familiar with ourselves today. In the ancient Greek terms, between the free and the unfree, the male and the female, the local, the native, and the immigrant, and above all, between the fully politically empowered citizens, all male, adults, free, legitimate, and all the rest. Regarding the sorts of friendships that could in principle exist between such full citizens, Aristotle made a twofold distinction. On the one hand, there were the affective types of friendship, more or less equal. On the other hand, opposed to that, were the asymmetrical, instrumental types of friendship. Now, he, of course, preferred, in more than one sense, the former kind, and idealistically, as he wrote, friends have everything in common. But he was a realist, and he spent more time discussing various kinds of instrumental friendship, since they were the sort that, for the most part, most citizens would habitually be engaged in and have to negotiate. What then of his definition of virtue or moral excellence in Greek arete? Aristotle was the original moderate, a firm believer that what was better or best in human action and interaction lay somewhere between two extremes. Anything or anybody who was too anything, for example, pious or generous, was by Aristotle's golden mean definition going astray, getting it wrong. How therefore to discover where that golden mean lay? how to practice it so that one became habituated to practicing it. Here, Aristotle, the realist, and in very sharp contrast to his mentor, the idealist Plato, allowed for individual difference. Virtue lay in the mean, yes, but in the mean as applied to a particular individual's natural disposition. Consider, for example, the emotion of anger. Like us, the ancient Greeks debated and uh, reflected upon whether it was ever okay to express one's feelings of anger. Or should it, realistically, always be more or less controlled? And they did so, they debated the issue with regard to situational context. So who was punishing whom, for example? In what ways? How much? And as a result of what sort of anger? More or less righteous? Well, what Aristotle brought to the party, his particular intellectual contribution, was to say that a person who was by nature more irascible than someone else, 
would hit a golden mean of virtue in regard to anger in a more angry way, a more irascible way, than somebody who was by nature less irascible. And so this was the basis, it's much more complicated than just the one example, of course, on which he erected a whole system of virtue ethics, which today still is influential among moral philosophers. I conclude, or rather I, I offer you two conclusions of different kinds. The Parthenon was, is a wondrous work of art in itself full of subtle mathematical harmonies, adorned with brilliantly realized monumental sculptures, both in the round and in relief. And it was voted for as a specifically democratic act and structure. As such, it was a model and inspiration. I, I quote Thucydides, it was a possession for all time. But at the same time, it was and is a monument to a democracy that is not ours, very different from our own, to an imperialism that even contemporaries found objectionable, to a polytheistic religion very different from any modern monotheism, and not least a monument to a society filled with a superabundance of chattel slaves, some of whom helped to build the Parthenon. So the Parthenon is a classic case of a very Greek phenomenon, antithesis on the one hand, on the other. And my second conclusion is this, a summation of what I've been trying to say. Philosophy, critical thinking, science, alphabetic literacy, writing, literary criticism, theatre, virtue ethics, all these we owe ultimately to the ancient, that is the pagan, pre-Christian Hellenes. The New Testament and the Christian Bible, on the other hand, we owe to the fact that Alexander the Great conquered the entire Middle East, which in turn meant that the entire eastern half of what became the Roman Empire was predominantly Greek speaking. And it's to those Romans who saw themselves as heirs to Hellenic culture and civilization and preserved and passed it on to the Byzantines who called themselves Romans, that we owe the fact that I have been giving you this talk today. So vivat Lusitania. And if you have been, thank you for listening. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for that very lively and learned uh, presentation. Uh, he, Paul Cartledge has agreed to take some questions. I think what we'll do is uh, see if people uh, would like to uh, state their interest in it, asking a question in the, uh, uh, in the comment uh, uh, queue. And uh, I understand that uh, people in Coimbra and the theater itself might be able to come forward, perhaps. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll see if we'll see if there are any questions. Let me give you a minute or so to uh, uh, move forward or to type something. Uh, well, while we're waiting, Paul, uh, uh, I think that uh, you have given us. Uh, a kind of very heartening treatment of the Greek tradition at a time when uh, more than in Europe or in the UK for that matter, uh, the classics are under attack. And uh, uh, we're in a world where uh, uh, what we have uh, set our lives to and what we thought we had an important mission to convey to uh, 21st century uh, People are, are are being criticized as a as a uh, a basically a perverse exercise. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts you'd like to share on uh, uh, how we, as traditional exponents of the matter that you've uh, done so brilliantly uh, today, uh, uh, 
uh, can uh, sort of stand up to uh, this uh, storm of uh, criticism. Uh, I don't mean to, well, some might call it woke, but that would be unfair because that starts with, I think, a justifiable uh, uh, resistance to uh, uh, exploitation of women. So let, let's let's not call it that. Let's just uh, leave it at, at my description. No, Tom, I think that's a very, very fair question. And it's one which, especially the older ones among us who've had a life based on study of the ancients, and I include the Romans as well as the Greeks, the Romans as well as the Hellenes. We have um, had the benefit, or at least we think we've had the benefit, of being properly educated in, in the ancient Greek sense of Pideusis, Pideia through first of all learning the ancient languages in their various forms and indeed in my case of course um, composing in ancient Greek both in prose and in verse my best result in my Oxford first exams at Oxford believe it or not well yeah believe this or not was in uh, unprepared um, Greek verse composition in which I was aiming to imitate to, to do something of the order of Sophoclean, iambic trimeters. But to be very serious, classics, the very term classics, can attract uh, negative attention because it seems to imply a certain self-satisfied superiority, as if anything else, any other humanities subject even, is not classic. And classic is, of course, a word which um, means both traditional but traditionally excellent in a class of its own or in a class above others. And this is history. Um, the term has a history. And indeed, I think everything should always be. If you're a historian, you have to contextualize every text. Very difficult to know where to begin to, um, as it were, do the other side of what I did, which is the positive side of what I think we can take from the ancient Greeks. Apart from, I periodically introduced the word critical, and it seems to me terribly important that the ancient Greeks themselves were not self-satisfied. Uh, inheritors of whatever their ancestors, their fathers, their teachers handed down to them. And I'll give you just one example, and it touches partly on what Thomas said about gender and attitude to women. I'm a great fan of Aristotle, you've probably gathered that, but I also have the most unpleasant task, it's a, a fact one has to face, that his views on the nature of women are utterly rebarbative to us. And that his views on slavery, namely that there is a class of human being which by nature can profitably be categorized as servile and therefore for whom it is actually an advantage to be enslaved legally for their own good and for the good of society, to hold such notion seriously to argue for them is utterly to my mind um, rebarbative however saving grace what prompts aristotle's discussion of natural slavery why does he feel obliged to defend the notion that there are such people as natural slaves and that natural slavery is good for the nature of the polis which he thinks is an overriding good, the community within which the good life can be lived is the polis. The polis needs natural slaves, according to Aristotle. Well, it's because some Greeks, i.e. other philosophers, people you and I might call liberated, liberal, enlightened philosophers, believe that all slavery, all forms, and by the way, the Greeks had 12 different words, for people who were unfree. It was a permeating feature of their ancient society. But for these opponents of Aristotle, all forms of slavery were morally wrong. Why? Because they were all based on violence, on force. In other words, not on reason. Well, 
that's just a, sing, a single example. I mentioned the theater, uh, and I make a big play of this. One way of reading the project of ancient Athenian, especially tragic, but also comic theater of the fifth century BC, is to see it as a form of both entertainment and instruction, civic instruction, in which the society's most fundamental values, religion, political, civic, uh, gender-based, are set at risk. Now, Tom, you rightly said that by and large, the ancient Greeks had a poor attitude to women, by and large. On the stage, in Greek tragedy of the 5th century BC, some of the characters, the female characters, are actually some of the most powerful, exciting, interesting, morally complex characters ever represented on any stage in any theatre in the world. And I singled out Antigone. I think Antigone is historically most implausible. A young girl, not yet married, standing up to her uncle, who's the dictator of Thebes, and then taking literally her life in her own hands and um, really frustrating uh, the desires of uh, her uncle. And he responds furiously to her, saying, you're just a mere female. You dare to stand up to it. Well, the point is this, that this is enacted before 15,000 people. Those audience members will go away thinking, my goodness, yes, um, is masculinity a sufficient criterion for power? Shouldn't some women have, at any rate, some recognition, and so on, so on. So anyway, I've said enough, Tom. My point is that the ancient Greeks' own culture was very often self-critical. There's no one, as it were, the ancient Greeks all did or thought this. At, yes, Paul, and I think you you, br you bring out your uh, remarks. I, I hear the fight that people in our generation have fought for uh, inclusivity and cultural literacy, but we haven't always told everybody every day that we were fighting that fight. And that's where I think we were, we can be faulted. There's an interesting question from Miguel Abrantes, uh, who asks, uh, uh, says, and then asks, uh, 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 what the, uh, what you said is interesting, but is often left out of the classroom. Students of classics are seldom taught the philosophies of authors like the uh, Boethius. What do you, why do you think that happens? Well, now, Miguel, thank you for that question. But of course, Boethius is, I believe he's sixth century. He's either fifth or sixth and wrote a work called um, the, the Consolation of Philosophy. And I'm pretty sure it's Gibbon, um, one of my favorite uh, ancient uh, historian authors. I mean, he's a modern historian, but he's writing about um, the ancient world and its transformation into the medieval and modern worlds. Boethius is called by Gibbon, I think, the last of the pagans, as it were, the finest minds that stretch back to ultimately Homer through uh, Plato and so on. And so um, why is it left out? Well, when one's teaching, there are two kinds of teaching. And if I could put it in this way, one is straightforward. You have a text. You're trying to explicate a particular text, whether historically or philosophically or in literary terms or whatever, and you focus just on that. And then there's what I call a meta level where you're standing back from the project of teaching students or writing an essay about that particular text and you're situating that action of teaching or writing within the broad context of society which enables people like Tom and me to be professors at major universities, to have really good students, to disseminate what we think is important about the ancient Greeks and Romans and so on. And that is the level at which the debate which Tom is referring to is taking place. It is what is the place of the discipline of classics as it has evolved since, well, the Renaissance within a modern society of the 21st century? What is its place both within the humanities, arts and humanities, as opposed to the sciences, and within the entirety of the intellectual project, including and dominated by biomedical, 
physical, nuclear, and other sciences. Tom and I have constantly in our professional lives had to defend, to advocate for, studying languages which are no longer spoken, civilizations which no longer exist. And of course, one could say, well, um, the, the Victorians no longer exist either. So why should we study that? But no, um, there are various levels at which one can defend one's profession. What's made it toxic is that certain features, and I've dwelled on them deliberately, of the ancient world, the ancient world of thought, are to the modern mind utterly rebarbative. And therefore, it's very easy to tar the entirety of those civilizations with an actually anachronistic brush. And that unfortunate situation is made worse when some of the advocates for our subject, or rather people who pick and choose aspects of that ancient civilization and culture, e.g. its sexism, its ethnocentrism, its, and you can go on, the negative aspect, and then apply them in, they, in their way which they think is positive. That gives us an even worse name than we already would have had if you're merely attacking us because some of our major thinkers held unacceptable views. Well, is there, are there any other questions? Uh, anybody else like to come forward? Uh, and, ah, uh, Carmen herself is coming to the uh, uh, dais, I believe. Well, she, she's getting, <laughs> getting her exercise for the day, isn't she? <laughs> what a pleasure to see you, Carmen. Uh, yeah, hang on just a sec, Tom, because she's... Oh, no. Hello. Hi. 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 Uh, okay, it's a pleasure to have you here, even if in this online um, uh, situation anyway. But I don't have a particular question. It's uh, um, uh, an information I would like to um, give to Paul because he mentioned that Antigone is one of the most performed or even the most performed of the um, tragedies, uh, Greek tragedies. And tonight we'll have here in Coimbra by our theater group, Tiazos, a representation, a uh, performance of Antigone in Portuguese anyway, but it is a coincidence that you mentioned, and um, I'm very sad that you're not here, and Thomas not also, but we hope that in the next opportunity, you can come to Coimbra and join us and have many moments of um, conviviality. And thank you very much, Paul. It was a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, and we are all warming to um, have you in, in person in Coimbra. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Carmen. And what a wonderful coincidence. And I hope the production is really not just excellently done, but challengingly done, and that the audience will go away thinking as well as having enjoyed the show. But it's been such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, dear Tom. I'm going to say Thank now you. goodbye. And it's been absolutely lovely <laughs> to see you all. Thanks to everyone who has come to uh, hear us today. <laughs>